it and we'll have that available uh, later on. We'll send you all an email when the recording is ready. Welcome to Epiphytes Life in the Treetops. I'm James Stevenson with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, Pinellas County Extension. We are a partnership with our land grant university, University of Florida, and our local government, Pinellas County. Uh, we provide free uh, research-based information to help our citizens make decisions in their own lives uh, based on research. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything or change your behaviors based on some kind of good or service that we're trying, trying to provide. We're providing you with information so you can make your own decisions on what you'd like to do. If you have any questions, we're going to be able to take them after. Sorry, we're not going to be able to do uh, live questions, uh, but if you'd like, you can send an email to my address here underneath my face, or you can use the email address on the screen, my Pinellas County address, to find out about more environmental education opportunities that are being afforded by the Environmental Education Center here at Brooker Creek Preserve. Please check out our Facebook page, uh, Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. It's a mouthful, uh, but it's worth visiting. The preserve is 9,000 acres of undeveloped Pinellas County up here in the north part of the county. Our trails, up to four miles of trails are open. Uh, we do have much shorter trails, less than a mile, so you can kind of choose your adventure if you come up here and explore uh, freshwater wetlands and upland habitats and all the wonderful plants and animals that are being protected in their natural habitats right here in our very, very developed county. So on to today's subject, we'll be talking about epiphytes. What are they? What does this mean? Perhaps you've heard this word. Um, let's break it down. Uh, epi means on. I think the, the classic epi prefix is epidermis, that your skin, what's on your body. So epi means on and phyte means plant. So these are plants that grow on other plants. The, we're not talking about parasites. There are very few parasitic, truly parasitic plants. The plants that we'll discuss today do not, to a fault, to a single, single species, fall into that category. So all the plants that we look out today, look at today are completely independent. They simply live on other plants not taking anything from those other plants. And um, have a picture that kind of underscores that. We'll be talking about our air plants. We have a little air plant here. We'll be talking about lichen. We'll be talking about some of our liverworts and some of our algaes. These are all growing on a metal fence. So how parasitic can you be growing on metal? Maybe it's news to you. Metal is not a living thing. Um, metal is not capable of providing any sustenance to these organisms represented in this slide, um, which would, if they had gotten another foothold, they would be growing on the branches of trees. And these plants, of course, are doing just fine. Epiphyte, epiphytism, I suppose. Epiphytism, epiphytism. It's a lifestyle. It is a way of getting your photosynthetic self closer to the sun because photosynthetic organisms, our plants, our lichens, our algae, and so on, they need the sunlight. And if there's a tree in the way, a tree is going to have branches and leaves, and that's going to cause what on the forest floor? That's going to cause shade. And shade is kind of not what photosynthetic organisms are too keen on. They're going to want as much sunlight as they can get to do the magic that plants do of turning sunlight and water and carbon dioxide into sugar. Sugar that the plants can use, sugar, of course, that we can use, the very bottom of the food chain. So these epiphytic plants, they just want to get up close to the sun. And here we have an example of some epiphytic plants taking advantage of the vast, vast real estate that is afforded 
by a mature tree, in this case, a live oak right here at the preserve. So you see this you know, 100 year old live oak has these large boughs and thick branches and all of that real estate is just crowded with these epiphytic plants, these plants that are trying to get their place in the sun. Uh, the trees not hard done by having uh, these plants growing on its branches. Uh, the plants aren't doing any harm. They're just up uh, closer to the sun, taking advantage of that sunlight. Uh, here we have even smooth barked trees like this red maple. If you look closely, the red maple has white bark. It's very smooth. It's not all uh, rigid and, and, and furrowed like the live oak, uh, but even those smooth bark trees the epiphytes have the ability to cling. Uh, this, is a, this is our southern needle leaf. And in the winter, when our deciduous trees, like the red maple, you can see it's missing all of its leaves. Uh, when those leaves fall, uh, these epiphytes have to adjust to the level of sunlight. Suddenly, in the winter, they're getting a lot more sunlight because the leaves are gone and not providing the shade that originally the the epiphytic plants that evolved to get up and away. So these plants have turned bright red uh, as a way of kind of producing a sunscreen to protect themselves from the extra ultraviolet light. So life in the treetops has its advantages, it has its disadvantages, but all the plants that have adapted this lifestyle, this epiphytic lifestyle, have also adapted to the various conditions as they occur throughout the year. We'll look at several groups of epiphytic plants. It's not relegated to just one particular family or one particular genus. Um, epiphyte as a lifestyle has arisen several, many, many, many different times. There are even representatives uh, who have an epiphytic lifestyle uh, that the majority of the members of that group of plants are actually terrestrial. Um, Still, they have found their way to live in the treetops. We'll look at some orchids. We have epiphytic orchids. If you joined us last week, we met a few of our epiphytic orchids. Here we have uh, the Tampa butterfly orchid growing on a tree trunk, hanging out over the water. Uh, we'll look at some bromeliads, some of our native bromeliads. Uh, this is the cardinal bromeliad. Uh, so here it is growing on the tree trunk. Uh, with its nice photosynthetic leaves and here it's producing its very very showy red and purple and and golden flowers we'll look at a few ferns this is an example of a group of plants which are primarily terrestrial uh, ferns are generally terrestrial plants that's where you're going to find the majority of them growing in the ground but some ferns have taken to an epiphytic lifestyle and we'll look at a few which are uh, entirely epiphytic, like this one here, the resurrection fern. And if you look in the background of this slide, you can see the, uh, the tree trunk uh, that these fern fronds are growing on, not in, but on. And then we'll finish up with some of the obscurities, um, like lichen. Uh, lichen is a strange organism. We did a whole program on lichen. You can visit that on our YouTube channel and rewatch it again. Um, or watch it for the first time, just what makes a lichen. Uh, they're often found growing on plants, although they too are not picky. Um, these are uh, historical epiphytes, if you will. Before people, uh, the only real estate available would have been uh, these massive trees to, to grow on to get an extra place in the sun. But in the Anthropocene, in the time of humans and our constructs, we have created structures that these epiphytes have been pre-evolved to take advantage of. So now we have lichen that can grow on our house bricks. We have lichen, we have ferns, we have all these epiphytic species that could very easily take up residence on man-made structures. Because again, remember what they're not? Did I hear someone say they're not Parasites, well done. They're not parasitic. They're not drawing any sort of nutrient or sustenance from their host. So we'll finish up with those. Is that okay? Is that reasonable? Is everyone good? Is it raining where you are? It's raining here. It's a little bit loud on the metal roof. So if I start to shout, um, I don't know, maybe raise your hand. 
tell me to stop. Um, orchids, right, some epiphytic orchids. Now, the majority of orchids, of our native orchids that we have here growing in the preserve and all the orchids that are native to Pinellas County are found here in the Brooker Creek Preserve because it's been set aside, it hasn't been developed. Uh, orchids are very sensitive to habitat destruction, habitat loss, but thankfully we have the preserve that's keeping uh, the land uh, pristine enough for our native orchid species to thrive. The majority, as I mentioned, are terrestrial. That means they grow up out of the ground. But our, probably our most heralded orchid um, is the Florida butterfly orchid, the Tampa butterfly orchid. It's actually named after uh, Tampa. It's Encyclia tampensis. Uh, here we have it growing on a horizontal branch of a live oak tree. Uh, this branch happens to be arching across a part of Brooker Creek that very rarely dries out. So epiphytes need their water and epiphytes roots. Remember, they're not parasites. They don't have their roots stuck in to the plumbing of their quote unquote host plant. They don't have their roots stuck into the real estate. Their roots wrap around the outside and they're used to hang on tight, hang on for dear life. Uh, the roots are still able to absorb rainfall, uh, but those roots whose primary job are to hold on, they're not going to have all the capacity to absorb as much rainwater as they need. So in between showers, uh, the roots of this orchid, this Tampa butterfly orchid, like many epiphytic orchids, uh, the roots of this orchid are covered in a velvety material that is able to absorb humidity. So in between rainfall, these plants growing over the creek have access to that evaporating creek water on warm days. And even, you know, after a rain, of course, the, the, the atmosphere is full of, full of moisture now. Uh, the roots, even if they hadn't got rained on, could absorb that. So it actually helps them to survive. So their, their roots are hanging on and they're also doing their best to absorb. So uh, the butterfly orchid is most often, not always, but most often associated with waterways because the plants can do so much better in a high humidity situation. And cyclia tampensis can come in, can come in, can occur in many different color forms. The basic color form is kind of this brownish green. Uh, the petals are kind of brownish green. They have one specialized petal called the labellum, uh, which is modified like most orchids into this landing strip. So the pollinator can see just where to go to land on this flower to receive its nectar reward. Uh, the butterfly orchid, the Tampa butterfly orchid, is also fragrant. So this one can attract insects that have a good ability, uh, a good scent ability. So many flowers are perfumed, not for us, of course, but for their pollinators, advertising that sweet reward. Um, other flowers, other epiphytic plants might uh, mimic uh, a hormone associated with the female of a of an insect species to draw the pollinator in uh, using um, tactics, kind of nefarious tactics to get the pollination done. Here's a head on of the Tampa butterfly orchid in Cyclia tampensis, just a better shot of that uh, landing pad that facilitates pollination. After flowering, the plant goes into fruit. All flowering plants, after they've been pollinated, produce fruit. And here we have the fruit of the Encyclia tempensis. It takes all summer. It's flowering. It's just finishing flowering now. Flowering time is in June, just finishing now. So from, for the rest of the year, uh, the butterfly orchids are going to de be developing these fruits. Uh, oftentimes when people most times when people hear the word fruit, they think, ooh, it's something sweet and juicy that I can eat. Uh, but in the case of this flowering plant, the fruit of this flowering plant, when it's mature, it's dry and it splits open. Uh, it would probably be best uh, referred to as a seed pod in that case. But technically, botanically, it's a fruit. It's the ripened ovary of this Tampa butterfly orchid. And when this capsule is ripe and the seeds inside are ripe, it'll split along uh, seams to release the dust like seeds. 
that will then fly through the air, uh, lodge in the branches of another tree, germinate and start another colony of the Tampa butterfly orchid. Another one of our epiphytic orchids that we're extremely excited about uh, is the needle root air plant orchid. Sometimes it's called uh, the jingle bell orchid. Uh, this is one of the ghost orchids. It's not the famous, famous ghost orchid, uh, but it is a ghost orchid nonetheless. It produces flowers out of nowhere. Well, seemingly nowhere. This is a plant that has no leaves. Uh, this is an orchid. And here you can see those orchid roots that I was talking about with that velvety covering that does a good job of absorbing rainwater and even humidity. So these roots, uh, they're not only hanging on to the tree that this plant is growing on, they're not only absorbing rainfall and humidity, but they're also conducting all the photosynthesis that this plant needs uh, to grow and eventually to reproduce. This picture taken around August, toward the end of August, these flowers, you could probably put a bouquet of 10 on your pinky nail. They're tiny. They're probably pollinated by gnats or mosquitoes, male mosquitoes, female mosquitoes. They're both nectivorous. They're both really good pollinators. So a very, very tiny pollinator for these itty bitty flowers. Here are the huge fruit in comparison to the size of the individual flowers. So these are those seed pods uh, that have split open uh, and they're releasing the seeds. Last year's flowers, this year's fruits, this year's flowers will produce next year's fruit and so on and so on. Here we have a picture of the first of the ghost orchids or the jingle bell orchids, whatever you wish to call it, uh, that we as a team here at Brooker discovered out in the woods. And as proof, um, there's a a creepy picture of your presenter in the background, um, more proof to your presenter's friends that your presenter had in fact seen this plant in the wild. Here we have the vegetative growth. This is all you get. Uh, sometimes we'll show this plant to visitors or if we encounter one on a hike and we get a big so what um, from non-plant people, I should say. Most plant people are quite excited to see this but agreeably underwhelming, just some roots like dry spaghetti stuck to a tree trunk. This is by and large what the plant looks like for the rest of the year. Uh, it takes a long, long time for these fruits to develop with their minute, uh, their, uh, their seeds are only a few cells in size. They're, they have no food for the developing embryo. They need a association with a fungus. It's one of the characteristics of being an orchid, all these specialized things, but they do well, uh, they survive. Uh, the Dendrophylax porectus, uh, the ghost orchid, one of our epiphytic orchids native to Pinellas County. The, uh, the majority of our epiphytes are flowering plants like the orchids, but from a different family. The orchids belong to one family. The next family we'll look at are the bromeliads. And you've probably heard of bromeliads. Uh, they're popular landscape plants. Uh, our spokes bromeliad is probably the pineapple. A lot of people like to grow pineapples because they're easy. You can uh, chop the top part of this aggregate fruit off and you have a, a ready to go next generation plant that will continue uh, to grow on and so forth. So bromeliads are a big family. Uh, they're also very ornamental. There are quite a few uh, many, many ornamental bromeliads. Uh, their epicenter of evolution is Central and South America. So uh, the bromeliads, as we know them, all the different species, all the different genera, originated in this part of the world. And this is where there is the highest diversity of bromeliads. Uh, time goes on. Uh, species mutate and change and become different species and different genera, and they eventually moved up into uh, the southern and southeastern United States, and we have a few native representatives here that we'll look at. Uh, more diversity as you head towards the equator, and then on the other side of the equator down towards the South Pole, 
But here's a funny little adjunct population of a single genus that's found in Africa. And that puzzled scientists until plate tectonics were better understood. And it was better understood that there was a time when this coast of South America and this coast of Africa were the same thing. And that was around the time that at least, at least one genus of bromeliads had populated this part of that supercontinent, as it were. And these just got carried away uh, as that continent broke free. And so there is one genus of bromeliad native to Africa, but they are primarily what's referred to as a new world family of plants. Another group of organisms that originated in the same part of the world are the hummingbirds. And a lot of bromeliads are evolved uh, with the hummingbird as if not the primary, then um, as a potential pollinator. And how would a hummingbird be a pollinator? Uh, their foreheads, their feathery foreheads. And we'll take a look at that later. Their feathery foreheads can be quite adept at transferring pollen from one flower to the next. Now we'll look at the eight species that we have found and uh, verified that they're present here at Burger Creek Preserve, which means that they're found and ver verified for the county. Uh, the majority of these plants cannot be found in all parts of the county. There's only one place in the county where they will all be found, and that's right here at Burger Creek Preserve. We have uh, the northern needle leaf, Bartram's air plant, the wild pine, ball moss, uh, another needle leaf, air plants, Spanish moss, all these common names, blarty blarty blar, but you'll notice they're all in the same genus. They're all related. They're all just brothers and sisters. Various takes on the same body form. The most common that you will see uh, if you do come and walk the trails here at Pinellas County are these five. The ball moss, which is also found in urban areas, also found in a lot of neighborhoods. Uh, the southern needle leaf, which is quite abundant, especially like the orchids over wet areas because they can um, absorb the humidity and the evaporate from standing in, and slowly running water. Uh, Simulata, the Florida air plant, the only one that's only found in Florida. Spanish moss, of course, of course, is probably a plant that everyone knows. And finally, the giant air plant. These are the ones that you're going to have the best luck at seeing uh, just on a casual walk through the preserve. We'll start with Spanish moss. The genus is Tillandsia. Uh, the species is Tillandsia usneoides. And usneoides means looks like a beer. Looks like a beer. Whose mind is where? Looks like a beard. Um, usneoides means like a beard. We refer to this as Spanish moss. It's not Spanish. It's not a moss. It's a flowering plant. Here we have the flower, very, very small, very, very fragrant, uh, probably pollinated by a moth. Uh, there's no expense producing a huge showy flower. Uh, this plant is relying on chemical signals to advertise that there is a nectar reward found down inside this tiny little tube. Uh, so if you've ever had Spanish moss in your hand, you'll know the scale and size. So this is a close up picture of a very, very small flower with its own little tiny insect pollinator. Once the flower is pollinated, it develops into this fruit. And like our orchids that we saw before, this is a dry fruit that splits open when it's mature. So that the sides of the fruit peel back and reveal the seeds inside that are equipped with little plumes that like the orchid, take advantage of breezes to take the seeds using that plume across the forest to land on the trunk of another tree where it can germinate and grow into another colony of Spanish moss, starting from just the one plant. Um, a lot of people are scared of Spanish moss. They think that Spanish moss harbors horrible blood-sucking insects. While the horrible blood-sucking insects do exist in our world, 
um, sadly, um, they're not found in Spanish moss. Uh, Spanish moss hanging in a tree, minding its own business, swaying in the breeze. How is it going to transfer any blood-sucking insects to anything with blood by just hanging out in a tree? That's not how it's going to come in contact. That's not how the insects, that's not a good place to go if you're trying to find something to suck its blood. Um, insects and arachnids as well, kind of the red bugs or chiggers. Once Spanish moss falls to the ground, um, perhaps the ground dwelling uh, blood suckers could find their way into Spanish moss, but they could find their way into anything on the ground. Uh, so unfortunately, Spanish moss has been given this uh, false association with blood sucking insects. Um, not true. Ball moss, very similar to Spanish moss, also very gray. Uh, ball moss grows in a ball and it produces its flowers out on long stalks. If you'll recall the Spanish moss, the flowers are kind of nestled just at the tip of these very simple little branches that are nothing more than three leaves and a flower. Uh, the ball moss is a bit more complicated. Uh, it curves in on itself, it recurves, if you will, and produces flowers way out here. So the, the pollinators can kind of hang out around the edges and not worry about having to snoop around inside. Now, what gives these two plants their gray color is also what gives them an edge in growing it as epiphytes. Their leaves are covered in microscopic scales. So this is a photograph of just two leaves of Spanish moss. And these scales, you can see where they're attached. They have this kind of polka dot where they're attached to the leaf surface, but the scales rise up off the surface. It's not unusual for this entire genus, but it's most exaggerated in the ball moss and the Spanish moss. These increase the surface area of the leaves and allow that surface area to absorb as much rain as possible and as much humidity, if that's what it's depending on. We looked at southern needle leaf at the beginning. It has this pretty red color in the winter. It's that, um, that protection, that ultraviolet protection, producing an abundance of the red pigments in the leaves that help protect the more um, fragile chlorophyll, uh, which it masks with these other pigments, allowing the chlorophyll to do its job while the red pigments kind of shield it from the harmful ultraviolet rays that are more intense during the winter months. Another genus, I mean, another species of the genus Tillandsia, this one Cetacea, which means bristly. And when you see a huge colony of these on tree branches, they certainly do look bristly. Here we have the southern needle leaf showing its red phase, and it's growing next to the Florida air plant here. Uh, this is our endemic. This one's only found in Florida. All these other species you can find throughout the Caribbean and South America, but this one, the Florida air plant, is unique to our peninsula, to Lancia simulata. And simulata, um, it means it looks like something else. So here we have it with its gray leaves, kind of a thick base, uh, it has a, a, the flower stalk. The leaves on the flower stalk itself turn bright red. Uh, that could be as a, a, a help to attract pollinators, uh, showing that there's something worth examining over here. Perhaps there's some small purple flowers at the top. Uh, simulated because it looks like something else. It is similar to another species of Tillandsia. The only endemic is the fancy word for only found in Florida. And here we have a close-up of that flower bud. So if you look closely, this is the tip of that flowering stem. An individual purple flower hasn't quite opened yet. You can see even the modified leaves that protect the developing flower. They're covered in those scales. You can see the thin leaf tips here covered in those scales that help it survive in, uh, in low water situations. And here we have that hummingbird adaptation. A long tubular flower, the nectar is contained in the base of the flower, the pollen is produced on these anthers, and if you can imagine a hummingbird flying up to this flower, these anthers are perfectly positioned just to dust 
a little bit of pollen onto the forehead of the visiting hummingbird. The hummingbird then unknowingly goes and transfers the pollen to the next flower that it goes and visits. Once these flowers have been pollinated, fertilized, the fruit begins to grow. And remember this group of plants, uh, this genus in particular, this Tillandsia, has a dry fruit that splits open when it's ripe and releases those seeds. Each individual little seed uh, carried on a parachute that can take it from one tree branch to another tree branch to germinate and grow. So those are the species that you're most likely to see. You'll see them all over the tree branches. They're doing just fine. Spanish moss everywhere, ball moss, uh, the southern needle leaf, uh, the simulata, but there's some bad news. The rest of the species that we have represented here in our county are falling victim to an imported pest. Um, we've heard about uh, weed species, invasive plant species, invasive exotic plant species. Well, this is one of those invasive exotic animal species. In this case, an insect, a type of beetle that's called a weevil. And weevils are beetles with these long kind of comedy uh, gonzo from the Muppet Show. Do y'all remember that? Anyway, long uh, feeding. They're, they're, they'll feed on leaf surfaces. They'll feed on roots. There's all kinds of different. Uh, but this particular weevil, our native bromeliads are not adapted to. Um, this weevil lays its eggs in nothing but bromeliads. And its larvae are voracious. Once the eggs of that weevil hatch, the larva, which looks like a caterpillar, uh, it's technically a grub, uses these huge mandibles to chew apart whatever bromeliad it's been, the egg has been laid on. And our native species, they're not adapted because this insect is outside of its natural range. Uh, it has no natural predator. Um, the thought of bringing in even more species of insects to control this weevil, that takes a lot of public buy-in. Um, so for now, we're just suffering through uh, kind of an infestation throughout our natural areas of this weevil doing its damage. And here's a, one of our larger natives, and you can see the inside has been completely hollowed out. Uh, this plant is done. It cannot recover from that. Uh, control, because this is a kind of a recently arrived, it probably came in on ornamental species, either wild collected or grown in a nursery near a wild area where this animal was able to infest the nursery plants. Um, it, the larva, the grub, does have a natural enemy, but it's very, very sensitive to heat, ironically. So the, the, the natural uh, predator uh, is very sensitive to heat, not a good thing. Another thing about the natural predator, it's a mosquito. So talk about hard to have public buy-in. We're gonna release a new species of mosquito into your neighborhood to control this doesn't sound too good. So more work is required there. Another one of our endangered species, simply not only because of habitat destruction, but also because of the presence of this weevil is the northern needle leaf um, with the strongly recurved or humans, non-botanist humans would call that extremely curly uh, leaf tips. So that's how you can recognize this one. It also has a very, very fat cistern. Cistern, just like uh, the water catchment devices that humans use. Uh, certain air plants have cisterns where the water, rainwater can collect. So in times of drought, it's little roots that aren't really doing much in the way of absorbing water. Uh, it can keep that reserve of water here in the cistern. And it's a lot of these larger cistern forming uh, bromeliads that are the most sensitive to the effects of that beetle because the grub likes to eat those juicy, juicy leaf tips that are found down in the base of that cistern area. Uh, they do form this huge bulbous structure, as I mentioned, that also 
uh, collects water. You can see this, the flowering stems and the, even the leaves that are associated with that flowering stem. Bright red, attracting pollinators, uh, just signaling through the, through the dense forest that there's something happening over here that might be worth investigating. Now the cistern can help the plant survive during drought, but it's not essential. Uh, here we have a plant that's upside down. So that, that cistern, that water storage area, isn't working as water storage, but the plant is doing just fine. It has come up in a place, looks like it's growing on a cypress here, so it's probably out in a swamp. Uh, the scales on the leaves are probably doing a good enough job uh, keeping that plant hydrated so it can go through its life cycle. This is Bartram's air plant. This is what our endemic uh, Tillandsia simulata, remember it's called simulata, the Florida air plant, because it looks like something else. This is what it looks like, or this is what whoever named it thought it looked like. I think that Bartram's air plant looks a lot more like the southern needle leaf. Do you remember that one, the third one we looked at with the really, really narrow, pretty red leaves? This one too has those extremely narrow leaves, but they're gray. So that's how you can tell the two apart. That's how I can tell the two apart. Um, very skinny needle-like and gray, it's Bartram. Very skinny needle-like and olive or red, it's the southern needle leaf. So this is Bartram's, it's another one that's endangered. But you can see the family or even the genus similarity these long flower stalks that are colored bright red and the tubular purple flowers in this case sticking out, uh, hoping for a tubular faced insect or bird in the, in the, in the case of a hummingbird to pass by and, and um, transport its pollen from one plant to the other. Generally, this, uh, this plant will grow kind of in hemispherical collars, kind of horizontal hemispherical collars around a tree trunk. So the growth habit can also help in identification. One of our largest air plants is the cardinal air plant. It's big. When it flowers, it is beautiful. And unfortunately, it's big. And unfortunately, it's beautiful because those two characteristics have led it to be over collected in the wild. And it, Still to this day, uh, people go into parks and preserves and uh, land that's been set aside and they'll harvest these plants out of the wild and sell them on the roadside as air plants, Florida air plants, sell them to tourists, tell them to take them home, watch them die, sad. Um, so not only is habitat destruction threatening these plants, but so is collection. But you can see when it flowers, why someone would might want to have this plant uh, in their possession. It has these, as with many of our Tillandsia, it has these very bright flowering stem colors, uh, not only red, but accented with gold and the bright purple tubular flowers sticking out here and there. I believe this was last year's flower. We know of a secret plant of this, most of the others have either fallen victim to the weevil here at Brooker or uh, because people have been on our trails for so many years. Uh, the, sadly, not all hikers are good people like you and us. Uh, they might have noticed this plant and snatched it out of our preserve. Um, but you can see why someone would like this. That's the cardinal air plant. Looking like it. Uh, but with a flower spike that's not quite as impressive, what it makes up for in the, in the flowering prettiness, uh, it makes up for in size. So what it lacks in a beautiful flower, it makes up for in sheer size and drama. This is the giant air plant. Uh, when it does flower, uh, this flower spike can be six feet tall uh, with, hun with thousands of flowers. 10,000 seeds produced by a single plant, uh, but this plant doesn't flower from year to year. It grows for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. When everything is just great and it's big enough and it's got enough energy, it sends forth this six foot tall flower spike, flowers, gets fertilized, produces those 10,000 seeds, sends all 10,000 out into the world, and then this plant dies. 
So it's the same idea as one of your uh, century plants that sits for a hundred years legendarily, uh, then flowers and dies. Uh, many plants that flower and die also produce offsets, which are sometimes called pups. This plant doesn't do that. Uh, this single plant, once it's flowered, will disappear, will die, will disappear from this site. So the giant air plant, it can be mistaken for the cardinal, uh, but the leaves are a little bit more recurved, a little bit more bent over, a little bit more arched. If we were looking at cardinal air plants here, uh, these leaves would be pointing straight up. So that's how at a distance uh, you can tell the difference between the cardinal air plant and the giant air plant. Most of the information, not most, but a lot of the information that came from uh, this section on bromeliads, you can read about in this book, Native Bromeliads of Florida. Um, we only have a few species compared to all the ones that are found from the Panhandle through Central Florida, and of course, of course, our tropical southern climate with several different genera, uh, native bromeliads of Florida. This is produced out of the Selby Botanic Gardens in Sarasota. And Selby Botanic Gardens, since you've tuned into epiphytes today, it, it's certainly worth mentioning that one of the key species, key um, subject areas that uh, the Marie Selby Botanic Gar Gardens focus on is epiphytes. And they've got epiphytes from many different flower, flowering plant, uh, fern groups from all around the world. Um, if you're familiar with rhododendrons or azaleas, uh, they're a familiar shrub, flowering shrub. Um, there are epiphytic rhododendrons, and they have a few of those represented in their glass houses. So the Selby Botanic Gardens, if they're not open now, certainly worth visiting when they are. Let's have a tea break. Let's all take a sip of tea. That's good. And we'll crash on. We looked at some orchids. We looked at some bromeliads. Now let's look at some non-flowering plants, plants that don't produce flowers, uh, the ferns. We have an epiphytic fern called the resurrection fern. And I've known this by a lot of different names in my botanical career, uh, a lot of different scientific names. It's always been referred to as resurrection fern, however. Uh, why is it called resurrection fern? Because here it is after a nice soaking rain, using its roots to hang on and the scales on those roots, like the hairs on the bromeliad leaves, this one has scales on its roots, and they help trap a layer of rainwater so they can survive desiccation or the dry times or when it's uh, in between rains in the summertime and certainly through most of the dry season through the winter. When there is no rain uh, during the dry season, these leaves curl up and they become almost invisible. Uh, so it is said that they look dead. And then when the rain comes, the leaves unfold and they come back to life. So that's this whole resurrection idea. Uh, this plant is completely alive. It's just gone dormant. But it's turned its leaves inside out. You can see the little spore producing structures are facing the outside and all the little pores uh, that the plants breathe through. Most plants have pores on the underside of the leaves. And what we're looking at here is the underside of this fern leaf with all the pores and all the spore producing structures. So if these spores ripen while this plant is dormant, it can release the spores into the atmosphere and they can land and find a place to grow on another tree branch. If this leaf was curled inward, those spores wouldn't be released into the atmosphere. They would just be released inside the curled up ball. Similarly, similarly, that's a fun word. Um, similarly, the pores on the underside of this leaf are exposed to the rain. And so when it does finally rain, the pores can absorb that rainfall and that water goes directly into the leaf, allowing those leaves uh, to fluff back out and do the job of photosynthesizing. So it can furiously photosynthesize, uh, putting sugars all up into its reproductive structures to make spores so that during these dry times can still go through 
uh, life as a resurrection fern, hoping for a second generation. Another one of our epiphytic ferns is the golden foot polypody. Crazy common name. Phlebodium, the genus name isn't much nicer. Phlebodium, do you know what a phlebotomist is? It takes blood out of your veins. Um, that's what phlebodium means. Fl phlebos or phleb or something like that means vein. And if you look at a golden foot polypody leaf up close, you can see uh, the network of veins that run through the leaf. It's not unique, of course, to this particular uh, fern. It's not unique to plants in general. Many plants have veiny leaves, but that was whatever it, uh, impressed the scientists that named this plant. Aurium means gold. And you can see the spore producing structures. They're quite large. Uh, this is a plant whose fronds can get to be close to a yard long, close to a meter long, so much larger than our little uh, resurrection fern. Why golden foot? Because the stem, here's the stem creeping along through the crevices and cracks of this tree trunk, uh, forming some side branches. You can see the little pointy bits. Those are the feet. So, and you can see the, that it's covered in golden scales. So these are the golden feet. And again, those scales, um, those are able to absorb and hold on to quite a lot of rainwater. And in some cases, even humidity to provide this plant with the uh, rainwater, the moisture that it needs to survive. Uh, the stems, of these individual leaves. The petioles of these individual leaves are very, very rigid. So this plant doesn't wilt. It can stay there during drought and just kind of chill. It doesn't need to curl up and disappear like the resurrection fern. It just kind of hangs out, the golden foot polypody. Our last epiphytic fern is very, very easily overlooked. This one's called the shoestring fern. Uh, Viteria is the genus name, Lineata, because its leaves, its fronds, if you will, since it's technically a fern, are reduced to nothing more than lines, lineata. They're just little lines that kind of come off a stem that creeps up the tree bark. If you can see in the background, some moss and some lichen growing on this tree trunk and a little uh, shoestring fern hanging on for dear life. Uh, here in Pinellas County, this fern isn't found very widely. It's only in little pockets here and there, not very widespread where it is found. Uh, but as you go further south, it's much more prevalent, much more abundant. Uh, the leaves tend to be much longer and wider. Uh, they get to be so long and so wide that they could be mistaken uh, for the, uh, the Tampa butterfly orchid. So these two uh, further south growing together might uh, look a lot alike. But here in Pinellas County, they're going to be very, very narrow. We know of only a handful of sites here at the preserve where this fern grows. That's it for ferns. We've got these, this couple. There's one more, which I should probably add, but I'm loath to. Uh, the non-native invasive, um, what's it called? The Boston fern, sword fern. The non-native Boston, Boston fern or sword fern. Of the sword ferns that are established, native or not, in Florida, if you see one of the sword ferns growing epiphytically, either on a tree branch, in a tree crutch, maybe up in the boots of palm trees, that would be the non-native. Our native sword ferns do not have the ability to live epiphytically, but the non-native tuberous sword fern can. That's just an aside. Lichen. Finishing up, I think, with lichen and a couple of other weirdos. How are we doing on time? We'll race to the lichens, not too much to say. These are epiphytic organisms. We do a whole class on lichens, if you joined us for that. Uh, they're a combination, fungus, algae, bacteria, yeast, crazy, crazy town. All these organisms mixed together to form this one unit 
uh, with all the different parts playing different roles. So a lichen organism, these occur epiphytically, so they'll grow on tree trunks. They occur lithophytically, that means they'll grow on rocks or bricks, buildings, um, overpasses, uh, bare rock bulbs in mountains, natural clearing, granite rock faces. So again, not parasitic at all. Um, they occur in several, three basic types. Although there are thousands of species, there are three basic growth habits of lichen. Some are referred to as crustos, where they form merely what's like a paint on the surface of whatever they're growing on. So in this case, this crustose Baton Rouge or Cryptothecia lichen, pink lichen, is growing right on the surface of this bark. You could not get a fingernail up under there and remove the lichen from the bark. The bark would come with you. They're one and the same. Not taking anything from the bark, just completely welded to it. That is referred to as a crustose type of lichen. Another type are folios, where the organism is anchored in two or three places along the surface that it's growing on. Again, here it would be the bark of a live oak, uh, but the edges you can flick up. So folios, they're leafy, they're like leaves. Uh, they're attached only in a couple of spots. Uh, this one is parmelia, one of the shield lichen. And you can see right along the edge, it's beginning to get kind of granular. Uh, those are little tiny pieces, little tiny clones of all the necessary parts, the fungus, the algae, the yeast, the bacteria, everything bundled together into tiny little specks that can break off and grow a new lichen. And there are fruticose lichen. That means that they stand up off the surface that they're growing on. And this one, we've seen this word before, Talansia usneoides, the Spanish moss. Remember what usnea means? Beard, right? Uh, so this is kind of a beard-like lichen, uh, which grows off the surface of this particular tree uh, with one main attachment point. The rest can be three-dimensional, uh, being able to absorb moisture, being able to expose itself to as plenty of sunlight for the photosynthetic component to make the sugars for the uh, fungal component to feed off. Another, probably our most famous uh, fruticose lichen are little British soldiers, little matchsticks. So here again, we have a tree trunk and we have these little lichen producing upward facing, upstanding uh, stalks with the little reproductive structures, bright red in this case, giving them the appearance to someone uh, of British soldiers. This is a species of Cladonia. Going way back in time, representing some of the very, very first plants on land are the mosses. And mosses being among the first on land were also the first on other plants. So mosses, which reproduce by spores, just like ferns do. Mosses, who produce these little capsules here, full of tiny little spores. Those spores can drift and fly, and if they land on a tree trunk, perfect, will grow here. So here we have a couple of different species of moss. Uh, this is actually a macro lens, which means we had to get really, really close to these subjects. They're tiny. Mosses do not have any vascular tissue. They can't get tall. They can only get as tall as water capillary action can allow them to. So water has to be able to rise up on its own capillary action. This plant doesn't move water throughout like, like most other plants do. Here we have a white species of moss and we have this green kind of uh, spaghetti looking species of wasp. These aren't even wasp moss. Uh, we can see these little structures. They're not leaves, but they kind of serve the same function as leaves. These kind of represent where all of our land plants descended from plants like the mosses. Another group 
kind of obscure along the same lines representing some of the earliest of the land plants, the liverworts, because when these were first spotted, uh, people noticed they were lobed, like livers are lobed, so they got the name liverwort as a whole group. Again, they're spore producing, they represent some of the first land plants, very, very easily overlooked. This again is a macro shot of this very, very nondescript little green plant. Uh, in this case, a lot of the green pigments are being masked by brown pigments. So uh, this moss relative, the liverwort, just looking like kind of uh, spidery etchings on a thin tree branch. Here's another species that's green. You can see the little scales, which represent the leaf-like structures. Photosynthetic, truly plants, not parasitic, liverworts, simply getting a place in the sun by living attached to tree bark. Algae, now we're going way back to where um, the first plants were single celled and simple colonials, like filamentous green algae, just simple colonies, not differentiated into tissues and organs like roots and stems and leaves and all those things, just hanging out cells with chloroplasts full of chlorophyll that can make sugar. We're looking at the algaes. There are even algae which have managed to break the bounds of being aquatic and become terrestrial and take up residence on tree trunks. And here we have what looks like uh, an orangey green uh, powder on the trunk of this tree. This is actually a free living algae, um, technically an algae, reproducing by cellular division. So very, very basic. So we've gone from orchids, the most specialized, the most numerous, the most highly speciated plants on earth, the orchids, all the way back through time to representatives of the very first photosynthetic organisms uh, that are considered plants, the algae. But we better stop here because we're getting a little obscure. Don't want to get any more obscure than that. Best not to. So let's just wrap up epiphytes today. Uh, these, are, these come from wildly different groups of plants, but what they share in common is their lifestyle. They live on other plants without harming their host. There's nothing in it for the epiphyte to harm the host. If anything were to ever to happen to that host, if that host were to get sick or die or fall down, that would be it for the epiphytic load. They can't survive on the ground. They can't survive in the shade. Uh, there are some uh, nefarious folks out there who will rap on your door and say, you need to do something about all that Spanish moss. It's killing your tree. Or that tree is getting killed up by all that lichen. Let me spray it. Let me kill it. That's not the issue. There's an underlying issue. The lichen are simply growing as fast as they can, given the fact that they're out in the sun. The Spanish moss is just going through its life cycle. Uh, if the host plant is otherwise sick or endangered or in decline, uh, it could become, it can begin to uh, grow more slowly or even begin to die. It's not the fault of the epiphytic load. Again, the epiphytes, if anything were to ever happen to the plant that they're growing on, they're gonna come crashing to the ground and it'll be over. They do not harm their host. Many different plant families, they again, they only share a lifestyle. They're all plants. They all have oxygen as a byproduct. Think about it. We give all the credit to the trees, but anything that photosynthesizes produces oxygen. So the tree itself is doing a great job of cleaning the air, sequestering carbon dioxide, producing oxygen, but so do all those plants that have taken up residence on all that extra real estate on the branches and trunks as epiphytes. So be nice to your epiphytes. Don't go around pulling Spanish moss out of your trees or, or spraying lichen with a fungicide to get rid of them. They're doing a very important 
ecological service and they have no harm to the plant. That's the takeaway message for today. I hope if you didn't hear anything else, if you were vacuuming or doing whatever, uh, that you at least got that part. Thanks so much for sitting with us today. We've gone just one minute over an hour, so I'll go ahead and say thank you. And next week will be our last webinar, uh, sit down uh, talking face webinar. We're gonna change things up. Uh, we're gonna take the show on the road and go outside. Well, we're gonna try, we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, and do either some live or some recorded uh, outdoor bits about some more of our Florida supernature using real subjects and real things that we can pull apart and, and look at and examine. But next week, we'll talk about some of our native ferns that are found here in Pinellas County. Same time, same place, Wednesday at two o'clock. Uh, you can sign up at the usual. Uh, this, this link takes you to a blog with links to the recorded sessions that we've done in the past and registration for ferns next week. Again, any questions about today, comments, complaints, anything, send it to my UF address there or my uh, county address here. So again, thank you very much. I'm gonna end it there and wish you all a great afternoon.